Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be discussing the colliding black holes. So the idea of colliding black holes has actually been discussed on this channel before, but in today's video I wanted to actually give you a bit of an update on what we've discovered in the past few months or so, and what we've actually established um, as of uh, I guess December of 2018 in regards to various black holes colliding. Specifically, I actually wanted to talk about how many actual detections we've already had in the last uh, two and a half years, and most importantly, give you an idea of what we've discovered. Anyway, welcome wonderful person, and let's talk a little bit about this. And let's actually start with a number. And so as of December of 2018, we've been able to um, officially detect 10 black hole collisions that you see on the screen right now. Some of them uh, were much larger than others. And uh, we've also been able to detect at least one uh, neutron star collision that actually made the news and I did make a video about this previously as well. Now, the important thing about these black holes is that um, pretty much all of them were so-called stellar mass black holes. In other words, these are black holes anywhere from just a few masses of the sun to maybe about 50 or I guess maximum of around 100 masses of the sun. These were not supermassive, these were not even intermediate mass black holes. And um, the actual designation for them uh, always starts with GW, which is gravitational wave, and then the actual year, months, and day of detection. So uh, this was actually one of the first detected. Um, and uh, interestingly, the uh, actual tool used to detect these uh, black holes is quite extraordinary. Now, first, let me actually briefly explain to you how all of this is done. So this is using the so-called LIGO detector, which is actually this extremely large structure that forms an L shape or basically a 90 degree angle and um, is four kilometers long this way and then four kilometers along the other way. There's actually two of them. Um, and if you were to look on the map, this is kind of where they're roughly located. And the distance between them is about 3,002 kilometers. Now, this is actually uh, very, very uh, specific and for a reason because we need to know the distance between them so that we can actually use uh, the location of these two observatories to tr try to triangulate where the actual um, gravitational waves came from. And uh, the future LIGO observatories are planned to be even farther away. Actually, one of them is planned to be in India and I believe the project is going to be called Indigo. So it's kind of like LIGO mixed with India. And um, that particular location will allow us to triangulate the location of the origin of the waves even more precisely. Now, there's actually quite a lot of new projects planned, but before I talk about those projects, um, what you need to understand is that this LIGO thing has actually been going on for several decades now. As a matter of fact, some of the first uh, original pr uh, proposals were back in the 70s. And um, I believe in early 80s, they actually tried to build first few detectors and they failed miserably. And they kept continuously trying and trying and failing and failing. And even in early 2000s, um, the actual original LIGO detector, um, the version 1.0 basically, also failed for about eight years. And so they actually had to upgrade it quite extensively and restart the operations. And it was only in 2015, 2016, that the first official uh, gravitational wave was actually observed after basically something like over 30 years of planning and uh, trying to get funding and uh, a lot of political and financial problems that resulted from all of this planning. There was actually quite a lot of going on behind the scenes. And this is why the, when the scientists were able to actually finally detect those waves, coming from those two beautiful colliding uh, black holes, that's why they were so super excited. Even though most people didn't really get why a lot of people were so happy that we were able to finally detect them. That's really because it took like literally decades to find these gravitational waves and to prove Einstein's theory. But anyway, uh, let's talk a little bit about how we are able to see this. So in a nutshell, what happens is um, you have these two really long uh, tunnels and the actual light starts here. This is a light emitted by a very powerful laser that then has the light split into two parts. One part goes this way, one part goes the other way. And um, as the light travels, if there's nothing happening, it eventually bounces from these two mirrors, comes back, and if nothing really happened, it realigns again, and if it's what's called in phase, 
it returns back to this detector and is essentially cancelled out because if the light is in phase, nothing really happens. However, in this situation when the light is emitted, let's say there is a gravitational wave that passes through and essentially um, acts on one of these lights that is in one of these uh, really long tunnels. And in this case, this light will actually get shifted just a little bit. So by the time that it gets here, the uh, light coming from this and this part will be out of phase. And in this case, some of the light actually seeps through the uh, detector and can then be seen by the actual sensors. And this is exactly how we're able to detect these gravitational waves, even though they're so, so minute. And when these two black holes collide, the actual energy generated that has to travel for millions and millions of light years, by the time it reaches Earth, is so minute that it actually only influences things at very microscopic scales. Essentially, the actual diameter of a charge of a proton, which is like 10 to the power of minus 18 meters. Very, very, very tiny. And this is actually equivalent to literally looking at the closest star to us, Alpha Centauri, and being able to actually determine the distance to that star with so much precision that you only make a mistake of literally a tiny, tiny uh, width of your hair. So that's how precise LIGO actually is. It's ridiculous when you think about it. And just the fact that we're able to detect these colliding black holes and the fact that we're improving at this and we're making even bigger and bigger detectors just kind of blows your mind. And like I said, we've been able to absolutely certainly detect 10 of these black holes. And we've actually even been able to kind of uh, come through the data very recently just to confirm that everything was as accurate as we thought. And so some of these 10 observations that you see right here have actually only been uh, confirmed after a very thorough reanalysis of data that was originally uh, detected, I guess, a few years ago. Now, interestingly, though, uh, the actual idea of a black hole collision at first was thought to be very, very rare. We didn't think these things collide so often, but we were proven wrong because as soon as the new LIGO started operating, within two days we were able to detect one. And in the last two and a half years, we've confirmed 10 and there's maybe even more we missed. And we think we'll be able to detect even more as the more sensitive version of the LIGO and also future um, observatories become more uh, become operational. And so at this point, we're basically re revising our theories. We're trying to identify uh, how many black holes there could be. And we're actually uh, now almost certain that there are way, way more binary black holes or actually just any black holes out there in the universe than we assumed. And so because we were able to detect so many, we think that we need to revise our estimates for how many black holes there actually are. Now, when it comes to data analysis, there is actually a huge network of over a thousand scientists worldwide working together trying to identify um, potential detections. And there's actually um, a citizen scientist network as well with over 400,000 computers worldwide using Einstein at Home program that runs in the background and uses your CPU to basically data crunch. So in other words, uh, all of these black hole detections were not just one or two people looking at data. This is like thousands or even hundreds of thousands of people working together trying to find out what we actually just saw. And for the most part, I'm partially responsible for this as well because I've had Einstein at home running for several years now. And this allowed uh, scientists to essentially discover these beautiful uh, events. Oh, and by the way, in this particular simulation, you can actually see the actual uh, analysis of what happens to two black holes when one is slightly bigger than the other and how their um, event horizons combine and become one. Now, this is actually very realistic in terms of mathematics involved, and this is what we think happens there as well. And I guess one of the most important parts about all of these uh, black hole collision studies is that it literally helped us understand um, Einstein's theories a lot better. Until now, all of this was very theoretical. And so the detection of gravitational waves and the black hole collisions basically allowed us to understand that the theory that Einstein proposed 100 years ago is most likely completely correct. And although the black holes by themselves are still quite mysterious, and these are objects that we still don't really understand very well, their collisions and also the simulations of collisions that produce gravitational waves are actually very well understood now. 
and mostly thanks to a theory from 100 years ago by Einstein. And uh, because we were able to detect these waves and we now kind of really know what to look for, we've actually started planning even bigger and more powerful detectors and hopefully in the next decade or so they'll actually become operational. One of them I believe is going to be 10 times as long as LIGO, which means that it will be able to detect things way farther away and thus be able to produce a lot of data about various gravitational waves. But what have these collisions allowed us to understand about the universe? Well, first of all, the neutron star collision that was detected uh, a few months ago, or I guess over a year ago, um, allowed us to finally uh, confirm that pretty much everything after iron, all of the elements after iron, are made during this collision. So things like platinum, things like gold, um, heavy metals are all produced in the collisions of two neutron stars. They also allowed us to understand that a lot of gamma ray bursts that we detect here and there are essentially most likely neutron star collisions. Uh, the black hole collisions, on the other hand, helped us realize how many of those things there are out there and how we're more likely to find even more and more collisions as we keep looking. And because the current expectation is that we'll actually be probably detecting these pretty much on a daily basis as soon as we have new detectors, um, this means that we can potentially use this for things like navigation or space traveling. We can also potentially use these to produce uh, very accurate space maps and maybe even in some kind of a power generation because uh, black holes are literally the most powerful things out there and the waves that they produce are extremely highly energetic. But all of this is still in the future. And remember, when we just started discovering things like um, electromagnetic radiation, we didn't really have any use for it either. And today, all of the things like cell phones work on that. So we actually might have discovered something that in a few decades will be very, very useful to us. And because it literally took us decades to get here, uh, basically, very, very long time before we were finally able to successfully detect something and confirm Einstein's theory. Um, it just means that um, we're going to get better and better at this now. Now, most of the simulations you actually saw um, in this video came from a single website, uh, from a YouTube channel uh, known as Simulating Extreme uh, Space Times Collaboration, where they have really, really accurate uh, simulations of these events. And these are actually predictions that were then confirmed with actual observations. So do check out their channel in the uh, description below to see more of these simulations. And on that note, hopefully now you know a little bit more about the LIGO detector and how it detects uh, these gravitational waves. Um, the fact that we're able to detect 10 of them in just two years and basically the missions that will most likely produce a lot more in the next few years. So like I said, we expect to find at least one per day and um, it's very likely that we're going to find a lot more really awesome stuff in the next few decades or so. Luckily for us, this is actually just the beginning of this exploration and with so many more um, observatories planned in the next few years, we'll probably be able to detect a lot more black hole collisions. But I guess the next big news is going to be when we actually detect the supermassive black hole collisions. Now that's going to be quite an extreme event. This is something we don't expect happens quite a lot. And when it does happen, and when we actually detect it, it's going to most likely transform our understanding of a lot of things in the universe. And so I'm going to keep my fingers crossed that it happens sometime soon and we can actually talk about it on the channel. Anyway, thank you for watching. If you still haven't subscribed, Subscribe to this channel because there's more videos about space, sciences, and black holes coming in the future. Also, maybe support this channel on Patreon and potentially share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences. I'll see you tomorrow. Space out. And as always, bye-bye. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking a little bit more about the phenomenon of colliding supermassive or not so massive, but a little bit massive, tiny massive.